Okay, we are now being recorded. I will turn it over to Dr. Eileen Davis Jerome. Hello, 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 everyone. Oh, you. Eileen Davis Jerome, Chairperson for Partnerships and Collaborations, our learning series for February the 15th, 2022, is now starting. And I welcome you and wish you the best for February, Black History Month and a month for so many other important things. Without any further ado, I'm just going to pass the baton to Troy Wolf, our fearless foundation liaison to introduce our fantastic program, uh, the Voluntary Local Review uh, and Partnerships uh, with Mr. <laughs> Joshua Cooper, Troy, Thank Just you. introduce Josh with his fabulous bio. I certainly can. Thank you, Eileen, for that warm welcome and welcome, everybody. So uh, today, as Eileen said, we are featuring our UNA Hawaii chapter, of which Joshua Cooper and some of his colleagues are on the call. Uh, we're going to go over the voluntary local review and just talk about some strategies that they are using to engage partners. But before that, Joshua has a very impressive background, and we did not share this prior to uh, this, this meeting. So I just want to share with you a little bit about who Mr. Cooper is as our illustrious UNA USA member. So Joshua Cooper balances academia and advocacy focusing on international human rights law through diplomacy and direct action. He's an educator with over a decade of experience teaching at numerous higher education institutions in Hawaii. He developed curriculum in over 40 courses, <clears throat> political science to focus on core themes of nonviolence, ecology, human rights, and social justice. Cooper has taught over 100 classes at the University of Hawaii. He teaches at summer programs with a specialty on human rights of indigenous peoples at the National University of Ireland, Galway, and the School of Law at the University District of Columbia in Washington, DC, as well as intensive courses on emerging issues in peace and human rights at the International Training Center for teaching peace and human rights in Geneva, Switzerland. He is currently the Dean of International Human and People's Rights Law Program in Vienna, Austria. Cooper is a human rights advocate engaging in global <laughs> really? guaranteeing fundamental freedoms. Please join me in welcoming our UNA USA member, Joshua Cooper to the stage. Joshua, you have the floor. Aloha, Troy and Aline, thank you so much. And I hope Bill's doing okay there. Uh, I just want to um, say it's an honor to be able to be here today with our president, uh, Joanne Tachibana, as well as Zephanie. And she's always doing the part. She's got the t-shirt on and the backdrop. And uh, what we'd like to do today is share how we focus on the UN Sustainable Development Goals as really a model for us for partnerships and collaborations. And maybe take you on a journey with us of what happens usually throughout the year and how we bring the sustainable development goals alive, but also to make sure that UNA is a hub to bring all the different partners in Hawaii together to then make sure that we sort of have a human rights approach, but we make sure we can achieve the global goals on the ground in our islands. And as I said, I'm fortunate to have Joanne and Zephanie here, and we'll just sort of cover a couple of main points first. And let me just give you an overview. First, we'll look at the SDG dream. And my SDG dream was a great initiative that Stephanie really began and thought of in numerous roles, I think at the national level, but we're able to crystallize uh, last year. And that was exciting to see the way she reaches out and partners with NAACP, not just here in Hawaii, but also at the national level. Another aspect of what we work on is very important is our Human Rights Day. And in Human Rights Day, we do that usually around International Women's Day, March 8th, uh, and that's at the Hawaii State Legislature, and we're coming up on our 17th annual. And that was, I think, our last event, Joanne, when we're all together in person. Uh, yes. We snuck it right in there on February 20th of 2020, uh, mm -hmm. as, as COVID was beginning to get more popular, unfortunately, getting <laughs> beyond what we had hoped it would ever be. Then uh, we would get into Nagasaki, uh, going to Joanne sharing the important we, we do, work we do around peace and our annual commemoration around Nagasaki. And then we're gonna look at um, the high level political forum and our VLR and sharing how we did that in 2020. And then we thought we'd conclude with the Feel the Heat 
uh, the pre and post that we did with the Western region all coming together. But we really thank you for joining us with partnerships and collaborations, and it's been great to participate so far. I'll now hand it over to Zephanie. Stephanie, please share about my SDG dream. Well, aloha, everyone. It's so good to be here with you. Hi, Troy. Hi, Jojo. Hi, everybody, um, as well as those who may watch the recording at a later date. Um, well, I just want to preface this by saying that this is probably one of the more important uh, committees and opportunities that you have, because it's really where we come together and have the opportunity to say, OK, so what exactly are we doing? What is our mission? What is our mandate? But then how can we actualize it on the ground? How can we think globally and act locally? And who are the people, who are the other stakeholders, who are our colleagues in other capacities, who are those who are accountable to us, who are elected by us, who have made promises to us and our communities that we can have conversations with to provide them with information and education and work together towards taking action. So I'm really proud to know that this committee uh, continues on and that each of you is showing up and hopefully um, asking really great questions and taking back ideas. And uh, we hope to have a few that you are more than welcome uh, to, um, what, how did they say, <laughs> steal them away <laughs> and do it, please, we want you to. So January is a special time of year kicking off kicking off a new year and celebrating the first major holiday of MLK Day. And my SDG dream was sort of born out of the inspiration, of course, for um, Dr. King's dream and inspired also by the urgency and the necessity and opportunity we all have to do something, especially in this decade leading up to 2030. So I don't have to share with you all the importance and significance of the goals, but what I hope you'll take away from um, from the initiative, which if you haven't already, I know that there's a landing page and toolkit and resources that still live on unausa.org. This is sort of an umbrella, of course, all the work that we fit in around the SDGs. You know, my SDG dream is just a platform to um, help share the dream and the vision and the idea and the ideals that you're working towards in your local chapters and in your lives as well. So as advocates, you know, and I, I had read about this in the op-ed that was published on the website, it's more than a mantra. Um, this is really a personal mandate for each of us, and this is a vehicle and opportunity to share that message. So it was really special what we did here locally at the onset of my SDG dream. Uh, we were able to partner with Joshua to produce a television slash webcast where I actually brought together two of my big, biggest mentors, role models, inspirations, the chairman of the National NAACP. NAACP stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Color People. There are um, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 2200 chapters um, worldwide. And then also the former chairperson emeritus of our beloved UNA USA, uh, the Honorable Tita Banks. And so uh, the four of us, uh, myself and Joshua included, were able to go through this rich conversation, of course, in the virtual format, given the times that we're in, going over the history of both movements, the importance and significance of the goals in context to Dr. King's dream and the dreams that we all have and we all espouse through our work, and then moving forward and then closed out, of course, with um, a call to action for those in our local community um, here on the islands and our uh, broadcast network to, of course, take action and share the dreams that they have. And so um, this was, a I would say, a, there was good coverage of it. You know, this is an example of partnering with local media. I know a lot of times I'm in different places that I've lived, there's always some sort of local media where it's the radio station or a local broadcast channel. And now, of course, with this uh, ever expanding frontier of online offerings and social media. Um, this is something where, you know, you essentially um, can access anyone's <laughs> um, and be able to um, have their voices be elevated and create really incredible content at very low cost um, as a result of people being able to log in in conversations like this. 
So uh, you're more than welcome. We, I'm sure we can share the link to that broadcast if you'd like some inspiration, low costs, um, minimal effort, um, and just bringing people together to have a conversation to uplift. And then of course, being able to continue to use the hashtag um, also as part of that strategy, um, there was um, sort of an op-ed, just a little blog post that was published and others were able to submit, perhaps some of you on this call submitted to UNA USA. I think there's a submission form where you can share what your dream is and what you're doing and then also share um, ideas. So we, I think we had published the Lazy Person's Guide to Saving the World as part of that, uh, which was a UN publication. And then also uh, for the last live Global Engagement Summit, we had taken all the sessions and said, okay, now you went to the sessions Here's what you can do to move the conversation forward. So, uh, so very simple, uh, short and sweet. And uh, I want to encourage you all to um, not just in January, but always, you know, that someone's just getting started in the conversation. Everyone's got a dream. Everyone's got a vision and idea that they're working towards. So my SDG dream is um, one of the platforms that UNA USA offers that allows people to chime in and join the conversation. I am going to be uh, facilitating a salon for those of you who are registered uh, for the Global Engagement Summit this year. So I'd like to invite you to join uh, the My SDG Dream Salon conversation um, to uh, be able to, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to drop a link in the chat here, um, to, uh, to further learn more about this and how you can maybe uh, take action um, in your local chapter as well around this particular conversation um, and campaign. Happy to answer questions later and hope to see you on February 24th where we'll be taking a deeper dive on this specific initiative. Thank you. Hello, Zephanie. Thank you and great way to include the Global Engagement Summit, which I know Tate and many of us are all working on. So that is a great way to show the next steps and also how we organize here in Hawaii, but then also make sure we're always part of the national movement. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Joanne to be able to share a bit about Nagasaki and peace. How does that sound, Joanne? Well, we're going to go to that first, or shall we do the interfaith harmony for February? I thought not going by the months now. I apologize. Sure. No, it's good. We can go with interfaith because we just did one of those. And so why don't we go with interfaith and then I'll go to human rights day, Joanne. Yeah, so and then I'm going to move down to Nagasaki. Oh, okay. Perfect. Hi, I'm Joanne Tachibana. I have been a volunteer with the UNA for about 29 years. And Bill Miller is an old friend. We began way, way back when Jim Olson was one of the directors. And it's been a pleasure all the time. I, um, I retired from the city council, but after 40 years of work. So we've had wonderful interchange there. Um, well, the United Nations Interfaith Harmony Group um, in Hawaii, we, UNA started sitting on their planning committee about three years ago. And um, it's Monday, it's February. So we, Joshua just hosted, brought together interfaith interreligious group recently. So maybe you want to, you want to highlight that one? Because I apologize, I don't have the flyer in front of me. No problem. Uh, yeah, so we just uh, hosted our second annual sustainability uh, and spirituality event. And it, it, the great thing is Joanne and Ed Young, who's also with the Baha'is, they will always come to us and say, hey, we got a great idea. What do you want to do? And uh, Troy, if I share screen, mm -hmm, please, if I could, I'll uh, share uh, our flyer for our most recent event. So Are you able to do it, Joshua, or do I need to make you a co-host? I think I'm in. Let's see. Okay. Does yep. everybody see it? Yep, it's coming up. Perfect. Yes. All right. So yes. this was our most recent one. It's our second annual. So after Ed and Joanne said we should work around the UN and Interfaith Week, uh, we did our best to bring people together. So this was our second annual spirituality and sustainability. It was the role of religion and rights to strive for the UN SDGs around the globe. And we have here two Kanaka Maoli indigenous leaders sharing their worldview, also members of Latter-day Saints. We have uh, Bante. Bante is from uh, Bangladesh, but is also the urban monk in Canada and trains 
police forces how to meditate and it's one of the things you're like only in Canada would that happen of course Troy we're thinking <laughs> would that be better if they did that with our uh, police here and then Benny Sujamani is with the Bektashi and that's unique too because it's of the Muslim faith but also recognize the equality between men and women over 800 years ago so uh, we also had Mongolian herders who are doing their best to prevent a, a mine from uh, contaminating their water that's then impacting them because their nature is, is their refrigerator, it's their lives. And of course they shared about shamanism and the connection with nature. So that was just this year, but go ahead, Joanne, back to you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so it's been a wonderful interchange with all of the other interfaith groups. And that's one of the goals for the at the UN Global. So I wanted to, that was the highlight that we continue to work with interfaith groups. And that's how our, our friendships with the interfaith peace community leads up to our Nagasaki ceremony. So I can go into that one next or later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that is great. So it, it, that's one of those examples of reaching out and partnering. And the other big event we had that was uh, last year was our 16th annual is our, our Human Rights Day. And Human Rights Day, uh, we know it's Human Rights Day is December 10th. We'd love to do things then. But I don't know, like you with your chapters, sort of after Thanksgiving, uh, people sort of sleep until Martin Luther King Day. You know, it, <laughs> it'd be hard to do something in December. Our student groups are in finals. So we decided to then bring up Women's Day and link the two. So uh, this is our flyer. Here you can see, uh, we took the SDGs and turned them into a palm tree, uh, Dr. Eileen. So you can do that in Florida too, because I know we both have palms, but we did <laughs> SDGs and then we put all 17 in the leaves. And, Thank uh, you, Josh, that's a taker. There you go. And so we had indigenous people's health in the pandemic and we had uh, Mariam Wallet Abu Bakim, and she was the former um, chair of the UN Permanent Forum and also a medical doctor working with indigenous peoples in Africa because She's with the Tuareg people. Uh, then we had a short film of Papua New Guinea uh, looking at their national review around the VNR. Uh, then we also had their UPR coming up. And then we have another event there with uh, Sierra Club sharing. Uh, we have uh, the HRC 2021 uh, linking up with what's going on that point with the environment. And we're very excited that one of the things we we're working on was a special rapporteur on climate change and human rights and they'll be appointed this year. So what we try to do, as you can see, is we try to do art and activism and film and speeches to make it as exciting as possible because especially with COVID, uh, people don't wanna sit around and, and I know if Ed was on, he would say, Josh, the programs are too long. Uh, you know, People don't like sitting in from 10 a.m. to five, but that was an example of what we did even during the time before, I'd say we we're too burnt out uh, with Zoom. So. That's our Human Rights Day. And with that, you can see here we have Sierra Club, we have global events, we have national, and we reach out to everyone to sort of translate what the UN is doing. Most people don't know what the Human Rights Council is or the Human Rights Committee. So we just try to bring what's happening at the globe down to that level. And I'll hand it back to you, Joanne. Looks like get your hand up. I just had one comment that I wanted to really thank Joshua because um, this, he works with the students and the, they also, <clears throat> I have testimony at the legislature, and um, I, I'm sure you may be aware that Hawaii legislature is the first to have adopted the SDGs as part of the Hawaii legislative goals. So, you know, Hawaii has placed, we're very blessed because the congressional delegation, the state and city are all very supportive of peace initiatives and uh, adopting the S SDGs as part of the direction for the state of Hawaii was very significant. And I believe we were the first. And I, I believe also for the um, Paris Agreement, Hawaii, when, when Trump was not supportive, Hawaii was first to say, we're, we're in it. So um, Hawaii has taken that, that leading role, even though with the, with the island community, I think we have significant contributions. And I really thank Josh for bringing students together to do all of this. Thank you. Thanks, Jojo. I'll share one more thing before we go to Nagasaki. Uh, when the COVID first did break out, we did have our Human Rights Day and we did that live. And then all of us, of course, we didn't know what was next, right? As it would happen each week, we all remember that March 11th when sort of pro sports shut down and no more things happening. And so 
we really thought it was it was time to also still stay connected. So we knew where we were going to do our high level political forum. We were going to have a BLR and be the first state in the U.S. to do a full one, not building on New York City's model, but doing it with all four mayors and uh, linking also from our congressional or U.S. senator all the way down to our county council members and civil society. So one of the big things we did was, it was a little wild, but we partnered with our Hawaii International Film Festival and they agreed to give me all of their short films. And so I watched all of them and we matched up Human Rights and HIF at Home, we called it. But I'll never forget, uh, you know, Joanne was in Pearl City and we don't get always see each other. We hadn't seen each other for two months and we'd see each other every night. So it'd be this great come together for anyone who couldn't see each other. And these films were 17 nights in a row, uh, dozens of fascinating films, 17 global goals. And we discussed about the future of sustainability in Hawaii over short films between three minutes to around 20 minutes. And here's all the films. And I'll tell you, some of them were a stretch for me to match a film with a global goal, but we did our best to do all of those. So there's that. And then I can share you just one uh, film that we did do that I can share with you because they did such a great job. We also partner uh, with each film with the NGO that works on these goals. So for this one, it was looking at youth. And so Pacific Asian Affairs Council is, I guess, our local version of World Affairs Council. And so we did this event and it was Human Rights and HIF at Home. And it was the Seeds We Sow with Puerto Rico. And I'll never forget Tungris because he was this chicken in India. And this little Tungris, um, not a chicken, he's a rooster. He had quite a little role in that film, but is pretty excited to uh, have that event. So we try to do our best with Aloha Plus Arts and Advocacy to achieve the 2030 agenda. And this was reaching out also, as you can see, many of our partners, Hawaii Green Growth, Seeds of Peace, Matsunag Institute. And it was making sure everybody was involved and that we would all meet. Uh, this one was in the afternoon for students, but the rest were all in the evening. So it was two weeks plus of meeting every night and watching movies and talking. So I just really didn't want anybody to be lonely and feeling like they were isolated during COVID. And it was a great preparation. Every night we'd say, we're gonna have a voluntary local review in June and July at the HLPF, and then really a big launch at the UN uh, General Assembly in September. So these were ways that we were able to continue that conversation. I'll hand it back to Joanne to share one aspect, Nagasaki, that uh, is really important. I think it shows the links between Hawaii and Asia and also dedication to peace. Joanne? Muted. Um, historically, you know, people may remember always that in 1945 that um, Hiroshima was bombed, the, the first city, and to end the World War. And um, then on August 8th, um, the, the President Truman signed the declaration to join the United Nations as being the first country. And so there was very much cheering that there was peace to be found. But the very next day, he also had approved August 9th to bomb the second city in Japan, Nagasaki. And so historically, people don't quite remember. They know maybe another city was bombed, but Hiroshima is this focal point. And so for, um, partnering with um, my chair's friend who passed away, Marsha Joyner, that for the past 28 years, we have been commemorating the, the Nagasaki um, bombing also and knowing that the historically what happened Hiroshima, the United Nations and, and Nagasaki. And we've been asked many times to join together with Hiroshima, but you know, when you have a family, you don't really want to bury all the bodies together, right? I mean, everybody has a unique entity and unique soul. And so we stuck with the, the, the Dr. Martin Luther King group. And so for the past 28 years, we have commemorated ceremonies and the people of Nagasaki also, um, you know, you know, with deep regret for all of the, you know, bombing Pearl Harbor and all, um, they, they 
raised funds from the citizens of Nagasaki to have a peace bell given to countries that were affected by the Japanese. So we the a peace bell, we have a peace bell in the back of our city hall. And I think they did one in St. Petersburg, Russia, and there's another location. So annually we were meeting there. And um, so I hope that we're gonna, we'll get information, put it on, on the site because this is like, I really would like to book Cecile on this and we have a wonderful program. So this year was our 76th anniversary of peace with Japan. And um, this is about partnerships and collaborations. And, you know, this, this particular ceremony, um, it's annually on August 9th. And that's, ironically, that was a day, the, the day before we had the shutdown in, in, but because it was, we had, we could bring 21 leaders together to, um, what's called Honolulu Miyahoji Peace Temple. And the Reverend opened up the temple for our temple grounds for us to use because the city hall was closed. Yeah. So, but we had a stellar cast of people sharing their views. And because we had the first lady of the state of Hawaii, the governor's wife, the protocols were very strict, you know, and um, and it was also very much fun to, to gather the group together. And um, but we also were able to assemble. We had two former governors participating with us at this event. We had the first lady, two governors. We had the chairman of the, of the city council. We had the state legislature represented, represented there. And we also had, um, maybe she should be a guest speaker at some point. We had Audrey Kitagawa, who also has won many UN, UN um awards and she was international academy for multicultural cooperation and so she was our keynote speaker from you know from new york and but we had assembled this wonderful cast of wonderful interfaith and peacemakers sharing their views about peace and um we had of course because it's, it's with the, the japanese type event the, the council deputy council general of japan joins in so um, we were able to bring peace messages from interfaith groups and the Buddhists, from the, from the Hawaiian community, um, the, the Baha'is, and we had the, the Muslim community, and also sharing the spirit of hula was part of the uh, assembly that day. But one of the out outtakes that we have done annually was that we have this um, sunflower project and because um, many of us of course are aware that the sunflower is not only a symbol of peace and sunshine but Admiral Perry in um, let's see what 1996 at Chernobyl right they planted sunflowers and sunflower seeds because um, sunflowers he said sunflowers instead of missiles will bring peace the sunflowers detoxify nuclear waste in the ground, right? So we have been using that. We made coloring books. So at, at youth festivals, we had coloring books with the children and sharing the story of that planting sunflowers will also have, make people aware of peace. So that, that's an ongoing project that we have been doing. And even recently, you know, in um, Fukushima, when they had the, their crisis in 2011, they also have been embracing planting sunflowers to transform negative toxic waste into something positive and peace. So Nagasaki has been a stellar part of our UNA uh, agenda for the year. So that's one of our very much peace peace projects and, um, and then our, really connects us with our community. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, I'll be brief so that we still have a, more time for communicating, but I'll just share with you around the high level political forum and the VNR and what we did at the voluntary local review. Uh, the one last thing I'll share before that is we have an annual human rights academy uh, or the advanced summer seminar and we look at peace, environment, human rights and global justice. And each year uh, we've been, since the SDGs have been adopted, we pick the goals that they prioritize to teach about. And we do that for high schools and uh, university. Uh, the youngest we had was he was nine years old and he was great. I'll, when the U.S. withdrew 
from the Human Rights Council, we watched the video of the withdrawal by uh, that point Ambassador Haley. And he was so good. He goes, oh my gosh, even a nine-year-old could figure this out. If you withdraw from the Human Rights Council, you will no longer have leverage to be able to participate. And to say you could go to other places like Security Council, Russia has a veto. Like, what is she thinking? How could she make such a statement? And it was just one of those moments I'll never forget with teaching this summer program as if a nine-year-old is debunking the, the ambassador to the UN statement of withdrawing and why we don't need the UN. It was, it was just a great one. But then we also use this one to really focus on the Universal Periodic Review, but more important, the VLR. And the students started to work on it and even started to work on a locally determined contribution around the Paris Agreement. So it's so exciting to see the youth work on these areas. And then let's see if I can do one more share screen. This is the report, and this is really working with our partners and Hawaii Green Growth brings everyone together. So this was the report. It's Hawaii's Voluntary Local Review of Progress on the Sustainable Development Goals. You can see the summary, executive summary here, of course, as with most VNRs or VLRs, People love the graphics and to make it look good and all of us in one canoe rowing in the same way is a great aspect. But it was really good that they did talk about a decade of action and looking what we must do. Uh, really, as you can see in the small corner here, that's the governor, that's our Senator Schatz who's in DC, that's all of our city council officials and mayors all joining together in that bottom left-hand corner to say how they're reaffirming their commitment to that. Here's Hokulea, which of course is a very important symbol of the SDGs. The theme was Malama Honua, and that was to take care of each other and our island earth. And you could then see when on World Ocean Day, Hokulea was actually at the UN headquarters uh, in 2016 and bringing back a message in the bottle from Ban Ki-moon had given him in Samoa. You can see here, we have an overview of the goals. There's three working groups that meet throughout the year. And we have um, policy, we have measures working group, and we have Lo Ikalo to the UN, which is from the tarot patch to the United Nations, where we're able to focus really on that one on green workforce and education. But the exciting part is we meet throughout the year, at least every quarter, and people have to update the dashboard. So we have one, I think of one of the most advanced dashboards. I think what we have to do now is get that dashboard into um, a way that it can interact better. Uh, we're making maps that show what is happening in each part, but it's great to really work. And this shows some of the examples of SDGs in action. Uh, just recently, I was asked to do SDG 16. And so we had to spend four weeks preparing the report to share with all the other working group members and coordinating that way. And you can see this uh, feature here on equity, social justice, and peace. And that's a picture of our state capital, which we miss so much because we haven't been in it since February 20th of 2020. Um, it was the Hawaii Green Growth is one of our main partners with this and they do such an amazing job uh, coordinating and bringing everyone together. And, and that's one of the aspects. Uh, the last thing that I'll share is, was a recent experience, and that was something never done before. Uh, but when you have energe energetic members, it was sort of my role as the National Council. Uh, it was uh, the Western region decided, well, before the actual Glasgow summit, what can we do? And so we have this Western region's climate forum, and it brought everyone together and it was so organized. We had a save the date before, which is not a thing we always do, but Joanne and I would do our best to get the message out, but we could all do getting things out a little bit better and sooner. But this was already out in September telling people we're gonna do this. And when the more we talked, we even, it was, I'll tell you what, to be honest, it was long. Uh, it was every Saturday morning from June until October 1st, uh, October 7th. I was so happy not to have a Saturday morning meeting. But it was a good example of really, if you put in the time, the results are amazing. We, we, had, we also had a pre-session. Our pre-session was the ABCs of the UNFCCC. And that happened uh, during the uh, UN General Assembly. But that was exciting because it brought in everyone who 
would normally come to these meetings and ask questions like, what is a UNFCCC and what's NDC and what's SDG? We had that session prior and that was for an hour and a half. Then on this one, October 1st, we had full panels uh, with even US delegates. Uh, Trig Tally was featured. Uh, Trig was great. Uh, he is one carrying uh, Secretary Kerry's binder the entire time. So we ran into each other in Glasgow in the halls, but he gave a great you know, behind the scenes. And what was really, I think most important is afterwards we had one more session, which was all youth. And we had youth from 11 to 22, seven speakers, all youth. What did they think of Glasgow and what's next? So that turned out to be really good. And even now um, I was inspired as Zephanie shared about TIDA. Uh, we did have an event with Glasgow where we tried to all work together. That was November 20th. And I wanna reach out now to Wafuna of Egypt and start seeing how we can communicate and that be a new thing that we really do reach out to the host country. But uh, we'll stop there and that's still pretty good for Hawaii. We, uh, we like to share and, and, and that gives us full amount of time to keep discussing and going over things. And then we have one great news that we'll share at the end. Just remind me for the really good news. But uh, Troy and Eileen, thank you so much uh, for having us here. And thank you for hearing just some of our leaders uh, describing some of the exciting work that they do and how we try to keep UNA's name out in the community, but then also provide leadership to make sure if people aren't quite knowing what to do that we say the UN is imminent and important and should be part of our local action. And we are happy to be the first state to do a VLR. Uh, and we're gonna try to do a midterm review or have a, another one every other year. So this year would be the summer we have another VLR. Thank you, mahalo. So Joshua, thank you. Zephanie, thank you. Joanne, thank you for all of this, this rich information and, and, the, and these examples that you've shared with us. At this point, we will open up to uh, Q&A and just general conversation. With that, with our guests and members, any questions? Eileen Troy, uh, yes. number one, and I'm sure everyone who saw this is so appreciative, and many probably have the same question. Do you have a link to those beautiful publications for the VLR and for the um, Climate Climate Forum? Absolutely wonderful, and I can see as Josh and I discussed earlier. Florida and Hawaii have a lot of similar issues and we could certainly use your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. And yes, definitely uh, we can share the Hawaii green growth aspect. And then we also have the links uh, that we can share as well, uh, specifically with what you asked for, because I think that's important going forward that we can decide how we can be more creative and do campaigns uh, chapter to chapter. And Joanne, fantastic. I was in Aichi, Japan for the 60th anniversary of Hiroshima, Nagasaki. I took a group and uh, the feelings just came back to me listening uh, to your um, authenticity. I greatly appreciate the presentation. And there, there are just so many things that you have uh, all participated in that's relevant to every one of us here in the USA. Thank you. Other comments, questions, ideas? So I do, oh, oh go Betsy. Yeah, I, yeah, thank you so much both for everything. It, it really helps me out here in little Albuquerque and Peter, I think I can say the same for you with our Rocky Mountain region. Anyway, I, you know, just to get an idea about you know the time frame because I'm hearing 20 years you know 25 years you know you know we've got 2030 and you know when did you feel there was a there was a time where it really kind of just people woke up and you didn't need to talk and they all kind of said let's go you know we're tired of talking I'll let Joanne go first because she's our fearless leader as chapter president and we've known each other for over two decades and she's just as spunky and energetic as ever when she won the first contest uh, as, a, and as a student talking about the, her vision of the world in Hawaii in that role. So Joanne, why don't you start there? Oh, but we're on mute again. They keep muting yes, you. Yes, so <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, it, it's, fa it's fascinating to 
be historical. And then Josh, just Josh and I have, we go back two decades is, is only 20 years. Josh and I go back three, maybe four decades, you know, we, we met in college, you know, so we've been old friends and many things happened. And well, Hawaii, you know, we're fortunate because uh, the UNA actually was chartered in Hawaii in 1968 by some very, very um, people that really cared about ma making the United, uh, United Nations relevant to our community in Hawaii. But my personal journey was that we talked about the Pacific Asian Affair Council, which um, at the East West Center was formed by President Lyndon Johnson. And they, they, they brought international leaders to be trained in diplomatic things at the East West Center. And then uh, one of the visionaries wanted the local students in rural communities, which where I grew up, and they brought these delegates to our communities to give us a bigger picture of the world. You know, when you live in an island community, sometimes you, your vision is a little bit small, like, you know, you grow up with 3000 people in a community, but here they bring a bigger world. And so, and participating in Pacific Asian Council, inviting my vision, my dream <laughs> decades ago, right? So I was able to patch in and then finding that there was a UN a chapter on, on our campus at that time, I joined in and became an active member uh, participating because uh, as a young person believing in the United Nations because there was a big dream, a, a place for all voices to be heard. And that continues to be our passion. And, um, you know, and I, I'm just so glad, but uh, I, like I'm really delighted and you know, Stephanie has been such a sparkle in the chapter because having young, a young person with vision, she was a wonderful MC for Nagasaki. I mean, you know, so we're gonna put, we should be posting the, the video because it was a really wonderful occasion. And so we'll try to be more interactive in terms of letting the national have access to things that we do, but definitely, definitely my passion has never, since we began many, many decades the road ago. Thank you, Josh, for letting me share that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So, so you make your comments make me think, um, and Joshua, you have history with indigenous peoples, but to Joanne's point about sometimes your vision, if you're from a small community, you, you know that very well, but you might not know uh, other opportunities and other visions. Can you give us any advice? There are many, many of our chapters are interested in doing outreach, uh, appreciated your, your faith-based, uh, presentation, but many of our chapters are interested in working with indigenous communities. And do you have any lessons learned on how you started those conversations, you know, with, with populations that may have a history of, of being manipulated by certain folks? You know, how do you build trust with those communities? Any advice you can give us? Yeah, no, that's a really good one. And I think one for me, it was lucky. I grew up in Waianae, and it, there it's very Pacific culture. And Joanne's laughing because it's, it's a side of the island where most people are like, oh my gosh, Waianae. It, but it's beautiful and it's close to nature. And I think that shaped my perspective uh, as I was growing up in beyond recognition or being aware of it. But the way I think we did it the most was there's a lot of work indigenous peoples are doing at the UN and to, to partner genuinely and not say, hey, we're UNA, USA, and let's have an event and we're gonna run it and then you get to talk a little bit. So for the anniversaries, uh, as Joanne, was going to share always on International Day of Peace in September, we have an event. So for that one, uh, we featured the indigenous peoples who attend the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues every uh, every year. And it, it, only the last couple of years with COVID has it been a little bit more Zoom and less interactive. Uh, even sometimes I've, I've raised funds and then we raise the funds and then teach the classes about the UN at UH so that students can go there and get college credit for it. So that's one of the next things we're reaching out towards is we raise the funds and then donate the funds to the college so that we can teach the class on indigenous people's rights at the UN and then make sure all the people go to the actual UN. And then we do the pre and post. I think that's really important. And that's what shaped my ideas for our climate one was I was like, this is the best way because not everybody goes to the UN and it's important to see if you're going how you're preparing and sharing that with your community before you go and getting information and insight so you can talk about it. And then when you're there, knowing you're really playing that ambassador role and how fortunate you are to be there. And then when you return, 
what did I learn that I can give back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been great. And uh, Center for Hawaiian Studies is amazing. Lili Kala Kamelehiva. Uh, she actually, I have to admit, I took a class with her when I was running a campaign for Congress. And they were like, you can't do a job. You're, you're the scheduler. You run this campaign for Congress. And I said, no, there's a Hawaiian Studies class I want to take. And I, I really like the teacher. So every Monday, I would just skip and run out of the office and go to that class. And that definitely frames some of the work. So I always give back now because Lili Kala was so generous in her time. And I think that's one of the things too in Hawaii is indigenous communities are generous, but we've really got to approach it out of rooted in human rights and respect. And then too often it's, uh, hey, uh, we're having an event. Can you do a chant or an, an oli and open it? And then, okay, thank you so much. Bye. And now we're going to talk. And I think we've done really good at not being tokenistic in any way and really organizing. And uh, we have much more to do. I'm actually taking Olelo Hawaii classes every Thursday night. I call Thursday my day of humility because I do ukulele. I'm surfing with Ari. And, um, and, I, you know, and then I do Olelo Hawaii at night. And talk about humility. Oh, my goodness. Like, it's the best. And I think we all need to do that. We need to go beyond the land acknowledgments, although that's a really big step. And that's one thing I'm, I'm looking forward to is we're trying to partner with maybe UNA Canada, Australia, New Zealand um, to actually take them to the UN meetings. And those are the countries that have been the most negative on indigenous rights, but have like human rights summer courses where we take everyone there. And then we have constituents who knows what happens and to continue to partner. And actually just last week, uh, I miss Stephanie, but I saw Ari and uh, I was having a meal with UNA Alberta in Canada who wanted to meet with me. And she's doing a, a research project on indigenous and clean energy. And we were actually talking about partnering after she returns, but we were having that meeting and that's sort of how small we are, but also how we're in the right place at the right time. So it's been great. And since uh, Bill's on, if he hasn't left, I just wanted to thank him because I started a television show during COVID and we call it Cooper Union, but it's Cooper and then U, capital U-N. And it was a nod to all those cool things Troy would always tell me about going on down there in the village. And uh, I had 24 hours to come up with the name. And uh, Bill Miller has got the best one, but I decided to do that. And we have a, a film. We have every other Tuesday, we have a Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights and at the U-N around the world. So. Um, it's great to share and everyone inspires each other. I'll stop there. That's nice. Bill, did you want to say something? Uh, no, just congratulations, Josh. I'm glad to hear that. And your check's in the mail. It's on the <laughs> way. <laughs> I assure you. Uh, keep up the good work. That's great. And I did put a note in the chat box. Anyone who's interested can go to globalconnectionstelevision.com and pull down any of the shows at no cost and air them on your TV stations, uh, at your educational institutions, wherever you would like to. And you were talking about indigenous peoples and I've done several shows with some leaders at the United Nations on the indigenous conferences at the UN. In fact, Josh, you and I crossed paths a few times up there as I recall when you were up there for the conference. So again, please take a look at it and keep up the good work. And if you could send a link, I don't know if you have the link, you may have mentioned it, but if you have a link to your TV show, I'd love to see it. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Zephanie, I've got a question for you. I'm going to go to Josh first, but my question for you, Zephanie, is going to be about your partnership with the NAACP. We'd love to learn a little bit more about how that came about. And you mentioned the local media collaboration to produce some content. And I think you said it was done at a nominal cost. There are chapters who are interested in doing that. So we're going to want to tap you and give us some best practices from that experience. Okay, so, so think about that for a second, Zephanie. Joshua, I want to ask you a question about your, your chapter, the colleagues on this, on this call. Um, you seem to be in a state that is very proactive with embracing the sustainable development goals in the United Nations. They get it, which, which, is, which is excellent, right? So, so, so that, that can really accelerate any things that you do. But my question to you is from the chapter perspective, what really is the capacity of the chapter to do all this? Because it seems like you guys are doing a whole lot of stuff. Like, how are you getting it done? Is it just the three of you? Is it a whole team of folks who show up who are dedicated? What is that formula that you seem to have cracked? Yeah, it, it, it's uh, three Ps, uh, passion, and then uh, patience, and Joanne has to be patient with me a lot, and persistence. Uh, you know, we try to come up with the events, but no one's funded and everyone's volunteering. And so, 
you know, I'm always waiting for a student to make that flyer after I've made it all. And Joanne's like, where's the flyer? We got the event, you know? And I'm like, I wrote it all out. I'm not good at power. I can't make it sexy, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we all work together. Zephanie like adds a level of professionalism to us that I appreciate. We must drive her crazy a bit because she's joined in, you know, moved here and really come in and blended in well. But yeah, she's like, let's set up the event bride and let's da da da. And we're like, Eventbrite, yeah. what? I mean, we'd have to have it out the week before it happened, you know? So uh, I think we're always striving and working towards being better. And uh, COVID's a little hard because every Friday comes and I'm like, where did the week go? Yes. And, you know, so we try to map out, I'd map out what we have for the whole year. And Joanne's like, let's make our calendar. And then we do our best to like, go, okay, we're three weeks out. We're one month out. We're two weeks out and try to get things done. Uh, but we, we we just keep trying. I guess that's the best thing about us, but we can always improve. So. Okay, thank you for that. Zephanie, over to you. Did you understand my question? I did, and actually all roads in Hawaii lead back to Joshua Cooper. So I learned that very early on. Um, that specific broadcast was a segment of Cooper Union, which he just uh, shared. But it also, um, if I recall correctly, we have a great relationship and Ari who um, kind of leads the charge on uh, campus at the University of Hawaii and uh, now has a role as the digital programs director over at the uh, radio station. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we also aired it on KTUH as we have done um, a number of our programs. So they're simulcasted um, across networks and across social media channels, which is available to all of you um, as well. But you create a chapter Facebook page or Instagram page, um, or even through YouTube, you know, there are ways that you can set up Zoom and other um, platforms to uh, Zoom to connect to other platforms so that even though we're like, for instance, even though we're in a Zoom meeting, you can stream it live to multiple Facebook pages, for instance, and that's called cross posting. Um, so we've, we've really taken advantage of that. I think that everyone's got a skill set. I really, what I really love and admire about the local community here is when it's time to come together, we know we can count on folks to come and that's I gave a laundry list to the types of people that you want to engage at the local level. So, of course, the first lady of, you know, the state of Hawaii showed up. Of course, our city council members and city council president and senator and congressman and, you know, all of those folks showed up. It's a testament to the decades of service that leaders like Joanne and Joshua have um, in the deep roots here in the community, but also the renewal of that by reaching out to them, letting them know what's going on, letting them know what we're doing them and giving them also opportunities to have access to the education around what's happening at the UN and beyond and within UNA, but then giving them also a chance to participate and be a contribution. And as for the NACP, um, that came about, I have a, huge, a long history. I joined an elementary school, the NACP, and um, have worked diligently and risen through the ranks of service over the past probably two decades now, um, myself um, personally, and now serve as an, again, as a national leader on the, on the NAACP's foundation. So, um, so that was, that's a function of my um, personal relationship uh, with the association and the other work. Although in this new role that I have with them now, I am looking forward to um, exploring what UNA USA and NAACP Foundation can come together and do, especially related to SDG 10 and, and beyond. NAACP is also um, an affiliate to the UN and has consultative status. So it, it makes sense in our movements together, especially in the context of my SDG dream makes sense. But with that, I would just say, it, you know, time to look towards yourselves, you know, mm -hmm. think about the campus that you work on or you, where you attend school or, you know, your place of work, your place of worship. Just take a look at your family and the world around you and let's just start, you know, you start there and you say, okay, well, what do you care about? And chances are it relates back to one of the goals, you know, and you can really start with anyone, I remember being our local chapter back in California, you know, partner with McDonald's, you know, <laughs> I don't, I mean, it's just, I can, there's so many different, it's really endless. You, you know, think about where you go grocery shopping, think about, 
you know, and maybe they get rid of food um, at the end of the day and they may want to donate it to your next event or they may want to partner with you to do a service project to try to share unused resources. You know, think about the library. They may want to donate space for you to have any, I mean, this is the most exciting work and exciting committee because everybody's got a role to play. And with these 17 goals, particularly focusing on number seven, I mean, the partnerships and collaborations committee, the toolkit, the stories that we're sharing here, the stories that you'll get to have with people when we get back to in-person events. Um, this is, this is really what all of the work that we do at UNA and as advocates is all about. So um, it starts with you and, and hopefully you've been inspired by what we shared here today. Thank you. Stephanie, so it's Eileen. Thank you so much. I'm a lifetime NAACP uh, member and UNA Broward. We have worked collaboratively with the NAACP and the Urban League there is a lot of intersectionality in terms of our community work. I'd love to touch bases with you to see how we can expand on that. I'm sure others uh, would want to know. I know I want to know more specifically some of the things that you've done in terms of service to the community. We honored both organizations for UN 75 among our 17 organizations for the 17 goals last year. And Josh, um, I would love to know more about what the indigenous people are doing as a whole. Um, we work here in Florida with the Miccosukee and the Seminole at, tribes, and we have had events together, but I'd like to know more about what you suggested in terms of how we can work more effectively. I think with uh, the local voluntary review, um, you have so much uh, wealth to share with that. Thank you, thank you. So we are quickly approaching the eight o'clock minute. Joshua, I did wanna ask another question. Many of our chapters are interested in partnering with the business community. And I was wondering if you have any partnerships or collaborations that you could speak to about how those are going and what that looks like. Sure, and that, that, that'll be perfect. I'll share our, our last great news. So uh, the one exciting thing we did was we applied to be a United Nations University Regional Center of Expertise. And that's focusing then on education for sustainable development. And we were able to gather uh, 40 letters. Uh, Ari was great. He supported KTUH radio, which is what uh, Zefkin was talking about earlier. So we had radio on there. We had uh, university-wide departments, but we reached out to other universities as well. Brigham Young University, Center for Hawaiian Studies, and we got over uh, four dozen letters. And then we just got this on International Day of Education that says uh, we have been selected and we are now the ninth uh, UNU RCE in the United States. Uh, so that's exciting. Georgetown's another one. Uh, and so we're, we're excited about that, but it's, it's a great way to come in. And, and this leads into the business one is I was trying to reach out to businesses and I was like, hey, we're just collecting letters of support and businesses were great. They're like, but how, what do I owe you after that? Like, if I write this letter, you know, do I have to contribute this much or that much? And I was like, no, like we're, we're asking you to come in because you already do education for sustainable development in your own way. And so I'd say Whole Foods has been really good. If I reach out in advance enough, they sponsor our film festival and give us some coupons. And I agree with what Stephanie said. It's actually just getting creative and making a list. So I actually have a whole bunch of business cards on my desk right now of all the ones I've collected during COVID. And I'm gonna make a new uh, database of all the businesses because during COVID, there's a lot more local businesses coming up that are really rooted in what Eileen is talking about, indigenous culture. One is called Mana Up and it's, they're a startup. So if you have an idea, they walk you through seven stages until your product goes in their store, but it's local ideas and Patagonia, just opened a new big building here and they used to show films. So I've been showing their films virtually, but now I've got like at least two dozen businesses I wanna reach out to and say, hey, join this UNU RCE with us. And UNA, of course, USA was, we wrote letters and we also got that regional West region to send something to. And uh, actually UNU RCE Salisbury is actually a UNA member. Her name's Brittany and she is a dynamo. So we had that in common as well, that we're UNA chapters together. But I think that's an area we don't focus enough on 
But one thing we did apply for and get uh, was tourism is of course our economy. Eileen and I would understand that. And we uh, have a Leahi Millennium Peace Garden, a peace garden at Diamond Head. And we're gonna teach about the SDGs to tourists who come in and then tell them to go home and do that work where they go because sustainable development is everywhere. And so we figured that'll be a great way to reach out. Another last business one was, I don't do enough on LinkedIn, but a Japanese tourism company found me and they want me to teach high school and college students from Japan who come here for one week each. And of course it hasn't happened due to COVID, but we've been mapping out where to take them all around Hawaii. And then more importantly, they would bring economy when they come and visit. These students would come, but then purchase things directly from the families, the community who are the ones who are taking care of the land. So that's, we're thinking about how to do it better, but would have never thought of it. We always see of tourism as sort of a parasite, but we now think of more as how to transform it and make sure the partners don't ignore the indigenous and, and really work together. So we're, we're starting, but it's a really good area for us to continue going forward. Excellent, excellent. Well, again, I wanted to thank Joshua, Zephanie, Zoan for spending this hour with us. Uh, this was a very informative conversation. Uh, you will see in the chat, there's an organization called SDSN USA. They are a network of universities and research institutions across the United States who are hosting a meet and greet on the 17th of this month, where they're going to feature two universities who are looking at the sustainable development goals. I put the link in there. If you want to register and find your way to that, that would be great. If not, no worries. Um, but again, we just wanted to thank UNA Hawaii. Thanks everyone for being on the call with us and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Stay encouraged. Stay safe. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Bye bye. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> bye, Betsy. Bye, Josh. Bye, Joanne. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you.